And you know the sun's sitting fast Just like they say nothing good ever lasts Go on now and kiss it goodbye But hold on to your love because your heart's bound to die Go on now and say goodbye to our town, to our town Can't you see the sun sitting down on our town, on our town, good night Now I sit on the porch, watch lightning bugs fly I can't see too good, I got tears in my eyes I'm leaving tomorrow, but I don't want to go I love you, my town, you'll always live in my soul And you know the sun's sitting fast and Just like you say, nothing good ever lasts Go on now and kiss it goodbye But hold on to your love because your heart's bound to die I Go on now and say goodbye to our town, to our town can't you see the sun sitting down on our town, on our town? Good night. Good evening, and welcome to this week in review. Tonight's stories include Route 480 closed, one individual nominated to council, Interview with MHA Calvin Parsons. These stories plus community events, the BBS Playbill, Off the Rack, and more coming up after this. Six months ago, she didn't know what kidney disease was. Today, it affects every aspect of her life. Hours of dialysis don't leave much time for bedtime stories. She misses weekend camping trips. She misses family pizza night. Her daughter misses them too. Through research and patient services, the Kidney Foundation is helping to create a better life for patients and their families. On Monday of this week, the Burgio Road was closed due to large snow drifts. On Monday, March the 8th, the Burgio Road is closed. Update at 4 p.m. This has become a regular feature that appears on Community Channel 10 throughout the winter season. This year, it seems that the Burgio Road has been closed more than usual. This past weekend, another storm hit our region and dumped more snow on the community and Route 480. Saturday was cloudy and just a little windy. However, the conditions worsened as the wind and snow escalated. By Sunday, there was a full-blown winter storm. Monday, Monday dawned bright and sunny. There was a hint of spring in the air with the melting snow and endless blue sky. The Caribou Trail was closed. We took a ride in the road to see what was going on. The road was clear in some sections, ice covered in other sections, and snow covered in other sections. We drove in as far as Louis Brook. There was a lot of activity in this area. The highway people were quite busy trying to clear a path to get the road open. We spoke to John Dunford with the Department of Highways. He told us that work was progressing slowly. They had mountains of snow to push back. Early on Monday morning, it took about six hours to clear a kilometer and a half stretch road. Frustrations were running high from the road crew and by those who were trying to get out for a variety of reasons. Some were driving directly up beyond the snowblower waiting for a chance to get through. This was a major safety concern. This is one of the reasons why the road close sign is posted. There were many one lane sections. In the Sealbrook area, there was quite a pile up. These cabin owners still have a while yet before they can enjoy their summer retreats. Old Man Winter still has a firm grip on the Burgio Road. It's still like a winter wonderland. The road opened at approximately 3.45 p.m. on Monday. Our hats are off to the road clearing crew for all their work on the Burgio Road. We appreciate your efforts in keeping our road clear.
Monday marks the hate was nomination day for the Burgio Town Council. Nomination day to fill one position on the Burgio Town Council was held on Monday, March the 8th from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. One person came forward to offer their name. We congratulate Hubert Strickland Jr., or Junior Strickland as we know him, for offering to serve on the Burgio Town Council. Our council now has a full slate of councillors to conduct the business and running of the town. Education week was March the 8th to the 12th. This year's theme was learning a class act. It was mostly the elementary school students that did some education week activities. The all school kept their activities included in their regular schoolwork. On Monday, the younger students held winter frolics. These included sliding, so snow soccer, and boot hockey. On Tuesday, it was mostly in-class activities. On Wednesday, they went to the police station to be fingerprinted, and they visited the museum. Thursday was more class activities. On Friday, everyone at Burgio Academy dressed up like their favorite storybook character. They also had an assembly. Compared to years ago, Education Week has really toned down. However, now the Career Connection Day more than makes up for this. Stay tuned for more of this week in review coming up after this. Little things you do that you think are small and few are the things that mean the most to me. So just keep giving whatever you're giving, cause even when you're giving just a little, if you're doing just a little, you're helping a lot. It helps a lot. From the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It helps a lot. On Wednesday of this week, our MHA Calvin Parsons dropped by our studio for an interview. We have with us in our studio today our MHA Calvin Parsons. Welcome, Mr. Parsons. Good to be back again. The road was great. A few snow drifts in some places. and. Uh, but it's a beautiful sunny day and the road was, was excellent today. Oh, good. We're glad to have you here. It's been a while. It's been a while. It was down in December. A little bit of sickness in the family and whatever in the yeah. last few months. But anyway, that's all looked after. And now uh, we're back on the road again. And the house is getting ready to open. So we're in eye gear and ready to roll again. In, in business, shall we say. In business. Um, that is a good place to start. Um, you're in opposition. Yes, different uh, role. Yes. Uh, not quite as busy on the ground. Uh, Joanne Clark is still working with me as my political assistant. Um, being a minister, of course, you have two duties as a minister and as an MHA, so it's not quite as busy. I don't have to worry about the ministerial stuff. But uh, I've been given another job as opposition house leader, so that's tacked some more responsibilities back onto to myself. What that entails, actually, is anything that happens in the House of Assembly now from a legislation point of view, what happens in question period, and uh, what issues of the day you want to bring up with the government. Uh, whatever happens in the House of Assembly has got to be conducted through ourselves. So we have every day when the House is open, we have to strategize as to where we're going to go, what piece of legislation does the government want, and uh, trying to rally the, there's 12 of us now, so uh, trying to rally the 12 of them to have a good effective opposition against a government of 34 is going to be a, a daunting task. Mm -hmm. It's not something I've done before. I, uh, I'm not used to being a critic. I'd much rather be doing stuff that's positive than I would be critical. But it's a role that's got to be done. So I'm looking forward to it. It opens uh, next Thursday on the 18th of March. The House will be opening. And there's a lot of burning issues right now. We have uh, the budget, first time budget from this government. We'll have a new throne speech on Thursday the 18th to see where this government intends to go. Uh, 
so far, I haven't seen much light of where they intend to go other than uh, doom and gloom and uh, quite a bit of slash and burn, it seems. But, uh, but you had to give them a chance. They just got elected, in fairness to them. They, the people of this province gave the Liberal government its report card last October, and uh, the new government has to be given a chance. So we don't see it as our role in an opposition just to criticize for the sake of criticism. Yes, the government has to be held accountable. Yes, the government has to be responsible. And that ought to be, in my view, our role. To be critical just for the foolishness of being critical, I don't think that's productive, and I don't think it does anybody any good. But we do have a responsibility to see that this government, number one, either does what they say they were going to do, and if they don't, the people ought to know that they're not doing what they said they were going to do. And if they're going to pass legislations and budgets, we have an obligation to see that we feel it's being done properly. And if it's not being done properly, we have an obligation to let the people know why we don't think it is or where this administration is going wrong. So far, there's lots of burning issues, and I personally believe that they're not going in the right direction. I hear a lot of what we'd like to do and where we plan to go, but we have seen very little details when it comes to things like rural development, uh, where we're going to go with our health care system, and so on. But let's see what's in the throne speech, let's see what's in the budgets, and then we go forward from there and, uh, and keep them accountable. Okay. Now, on a more uh, personal, local level, you are now in the opposition uh, before you were in, uh, in, uh, in power. Uh, someone comes to you now. You're in opposition. How do you help them? Well, the MHA's job always broke out into two types of things. First of all, you've got your one-on-ones, I call it, where someone comes in, they have a problem, for example, with something in the health care system or the social services system, or they just need a piece of information. They want to start a business and they want to know where do we go, or they have a road clearing problem. It could be usually one-on-one, -on -one. or can you help me with your passport, or can you help me get yeah. something when you're in St. John's. So that's the one-on-one -on -one stuff, and that's where that doesn't change. Okay. That's helping people cut the red tape of government yes. and get stuff done that they need done for themselves. That takes up about 80% of your work anyway. Yes. Always been the case that you have 30, 40 calls a day, and that's generally what the bulk of those calls would deal with. So that continues regardless if you're in government or if you're in opposition. Okay. The other 20% of your time as an MHA was generally taken up with associations, municipal councils, uh, local service districts, fire departments, what I call the group things, yeah. that people have things they want to get done and they put proposals forward. You had to arrange meetings with either bureaucrats or with ministers and try to get the proposals up and running, try to get financing for the proposals. Those things won't change from the point of view of the groups coming to me, okay. I'm sure. And they still have continued. For example, we've had several municipalities have already uh, been in St. John's on different issues and wanted to meet with certain ministers to have certain discussions. Town of Burgill, for example, was in some time back, the mayor and deputy mayor, and we had meetings. That was two or three months ago yes. now uh, with Trevor Taylor, the new minister of fisheries, and see where he stood and with Earl McCurdy. So those things will still continue. The success rate that we're going to have in getting funding from government, that's the piece I don't know okay. right now. And I think, again, I think it's not a case of, or it certainly ought not to be a case of what side of government are you on. The thing is, where is the greatest need? Mm. And if this community and this district can put forward proposals that are justifiable, and we can say that the money is there, and we can go in and make our case to these government officials and these government bureaucrats, we certainly ought not to have it all against us because you're not on the right side of government. I never operated that way when I was in government, and I don't intend to operate it. I don't, it won't be accepting of that because we're in opposition. Mm. In fact, that's the kind of stuff that would get you dander up and make you want to be critical if someone sure. tries to, to diminish or act against your district because you're not of the right color. So okay. I certainly don't anticipate any of that foolishness. And uh, any time I've requested meetings to date, I must say, we've been granted meetings and we've had very positive responses. Well, that's, actually, that's very good to know because most people, when you say, uh, for example, uh, uh, you're on the liberal side now, well, Calvin is not going to be much good to us now because he's on the opposition side. But obviously, uh, through your contact when you were in power and in leadership, 
you still kept up those contacts now that you're in the opposition. So yes. that makes a big difference. A lot of it has to do with how you treated people when you were there as well. Okay. If, if you were, if you weren't fair to the other side when you were there, you might expect some kind of, of backlash. Yeah. But in my experience, I never ever had that. Anyone who any wanted a meeting always got one with myself. And, and I think it's your level of preparation again. If okay. you go to someone asking for a meeting and you're not prepared when you get to the meeting, well, that's your own fault. Yes. That's not having your own work done. That's right. And what we've done out here in this district, every time I've ever gone to a meeting, is I'm insistent that we be prepared. Yes. And because you're prepared, you, you're, you're two steps ahead anyway, right away. Yeah. So preparation is still going to be necessary. I think the, the respect for our district and our representation is there. We will be given the meetings. The bottom line is how much money are we going to have? Yeah. And that, again, comes back to the budget issue. Of course, yes. Where we stand after budget day in any department, what monies are going to be in health care, rural development, municipal affairs, at this point is anybody's guess. Okay. And uh, I just don't know how big the pot is going to be, but whatever size the pot is, we certainly expect to get our continued fair share. Okay. Now, I know you do have some comments on uh, a lot of issues there, and the budget being one. And of course, you just made some comments. Um, in our local area, um, the hospital and the health care is another one that we had talked about earlier. Very troublesome. The, the Western Health Care Corp., which takes in the Burgill region, uh, as you're probably aware, there was a leak of a report that the board chair, Bryn Staben, uh, was asked by Minister Beth Marshall, the Minister of Health, to do a report on where the Western Health Care Corp. could save $3 million, yeah. which is this year's deficit, and save $10 million, which is the board's long-term debt, over a period of 10 years. So Mr. Staben, on behalf of the corporation, looked around Western Newfoundland, which he uh, is in his jurisdiction, and said, this is what we would have to do in order to meet this $3 million figure that you want us to save this year. Bottom line is, I've seen the report, it is draconian. If what he has said in that report is accepted by this government and done, our health care system in Western Newfoundland may as well be non-existent. Mm -hmm. Uh, in my view, we're pretty well cut to the bone in places like Burgio, Port of Bass Hospital, in any case, Bond Bay. Uh, there's no question that even the newly opened Stephenville office, our hospital, you may as well forget it. There'll be no obstetrics, no surgery, no gynecology. Um, you have no more clinics. They're, they're talking about closing out clinics in places like Doyle's, Rose Blanche, uh, Jeffries, and so on. I think it's 14 clinics all told. So where that goes is anybody's guess. But if it is accepted as it is currently worded, the health care system in Western Newfoundland is in big trouble. Another piece of the health care that's very troublesome is money for respite care. We've come over the last number of years to have a lot of dollars put into respite. People who have parents in their homes, people who have, uh, have severe uh, medical problems and need some respite care and we've been able as a government to provide funding for people to go in and do that. It not only helps the people who are in need and need the service, but it's also been a great employment generator for people in communities in rural Newfoundland who go in and do the servicing, sure. the workers. My understanding is that we may be in for some drastic measures there. That's the major concern I have of, of health care but generally it's a big concern because to be told that we're in serious, dire financial circumstances and you're given the impression that things are going to be uh, slash and burn, as I say, um, Loyola Sullivan being slash and Ed Byrne being burn, <laughs> uh, uh, but it's not a joking matter in that sense, is that we're getting no direction other than being told that we're going to have this massive cut now, is it in terms of services? Is it in terms of workers? How many people are going home, for example? That's the things we don't know. How many people are going to be laid off? And the concern we have as an opposition right now is it's one thing to talk about looking after the economic side of your balance sheet, but there's also a social justice side. And we're hearing about no wages, cutbacks in health, cutbacks in services, and somewhere you've got to have that balance. Now, we've been told there's going to be a new approach. 
And so far, what I've seen of the approach is not very pleasing. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I just have a fear that the budget could be even worse. So I'm anxious to see what's in the throne speech next week and what's going to be in the budget in particular. Because I, that'll dictate where places like us in rural Newfoundland are going to go. I totally agree. Uh, I think everybody will be uh, glued to the TV set. Uh, you're talking uh, teachers, nurses. We have all those contracts are coming due, and all of the public service in Newfoundland right now. The, the, the NAEP uh, union is up at the end of March. The CUPE unions are up at the end of April. The nurses union are at the end of May, and the teachers at the end of August. Mm -hmm. They've all been told right now. Not only is there going to be a wage freeze, but they've also been told that concessions that they always had and negotiated, such as uh, sick days, yeah. severance pay, and that those things are on the table to be taken back as well. Uh, there's already a government hiring freeze. There was an hiring freeze in government earlier. We've not only had the freeze extended, but we've had a case where there's been about a dozen or 15 people already fired since the new administration took over. So we're starting to see it, but where it ends is anyone's guess. Yeah. Um, I know you wanted to um, uh, comment on some things that are happening around our town. I know the hockey arena was one that you you wanted to. Uh, they were started sticking the steel when I was down here last, <laughs> and now yeah. it was nice to see that they got the they got the cover on it. That's right. And uh, I'm not sure. I didn't get a chance to go inside on my way in, but I hope to see it on the way out through. I'm not sure if they're having any activities there yet, or they're still working on the. No, they're still working on them. I was talking to uh, the uh, manager, site manager Frank Compton, and right now. Um, it, it is as is inside because they're waiting for the plumbing and the electrical and they have to wait till the ground thaws to go to that uh, next oh. uh, concrete stage. Right. And the RIC Commission is working to get the snow out of it so that that can uh, I saw the guys progress. taking the snow out yeah. today in the wheelbarrows there. Yeah. I figured there must have been a hockey game on because <laughs> they, were, they were wheeling out the snow anyway. Yeah. There's lots of snow in there. But uh, it's nice to see and it's needed in any community when you have a recreational facility. It's, it's certainly needed and it's nice pleasing to see that it's finally coming to be. Yes. And this is only step one. I mean, we've got things we need to do. Putting a shell on this thing is only step one. That's the one what step. do we do with it after? Yeah. And again, I'm sure that the community in the recreation community will have plans before too long saying this is what we want in terms yeah. of bleachers and this is what we want in terms of dressing rooms and canteens and so on so it's onwards and upwards as far as I'm concerned let's keep pushing for it that's right uh, the water treatment plant good to see I see it's up and running I haven't no noticed much difference in the color today when I'm here doing the interview with you but I understand it's going to go full force as of today or tomorrow as of today yes but it's certainly being commissioned uh, long overdue mm -hmm. uh, Probably the most significant, pleasing thing that I've had happen to me in terms of politics is to see communities with clean drinking water. And there's no question that Burgill has got the class act of all of them with their ozonation process, that once this thing is up and running, uh, you're going to have the class act of Newfoundland when it comes to water here. No more getting into Tobin's and not seeing your toes. <laughs> <laughs> That'll, be That'll be a, a pleasure. thing of the past. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a pleasure. You also wanted to, uh, you also made reference to the Burgia Road. Excellent uh, snow clearing today. In fact, uh, they took off the usual work services treatment, their clearing procedures that they used to have a couple of years ago. And we had some meetings. We had a meeting with the community and we brought in the officials from work services, Bill Spencer and the highway supervisors. Because we weren't sure then how it was going to work out with this new contracting arrangement. And this is the second year of operation. And I'm pleased to see that say that in two years of operation, we've had one phone call mm -hmm. concerning the, uh, the, the status of the Burgill Road uh, regarding winter snow clearing. Sure. And that was on Monday when it got uh, closed. And I guess anybody who listened to the forecast around Newfoundland on Monday we had some places where we set snowfall records, so uh, I don't think that's too bad. And uh, I understand some people, the cadets included, got stuck for a while, but finally everything is open this morning and they're widening it out again now. So hopefully they'll keep up the, uh, the, good, the good work that they're doing there and keep it clear, and we won't have any more problems with it. Um, I think we've covered every, uh, every topic that we said we were going to talk about. If there's anything else that you, uh, you would like to have? Uh, just to say, I'm glad to give an update. I'm in town again today now to do a clinic. I had to meet several people. There were some people who had 50th anniversaries and stuff I dropped by and visited with and uh, dropped into the water plant actually on my way through. And I'm at the town hall doing some clinics with people who have 
some problems because not all of them can be answered by telephone, nor do people want to deal with some of their True. problems by phone. They want a, an up close and personal one on one. So we try to do that in the way of clinics. So we'll be here today doing that. And uh, again, any time I can be of help, myself or Joanne, we're only a phone call away. Don't matter if it's day or night, weekends, leave your call. If, there's, if, if we're not in the office, there's definitely a message manager. You leave your call. And the commitment I made back in 1999 is still there today, and it hasn't changed a bit. You got a problem. My numbers are in the golf news. My numbers are known locally. Uh, by all means, feel free to call anytime. That's what I get paid to do. Okay. So if you don't call, I can't help. That's right. Well, it was really glad that, uh, we're really glad that you dropped by and uh, took this time to uh, speak to the people. No problem. And uh, I invite everybody as well to uh, tune in to the House of Assembly channel, which I understand you get, which will be back on the air next Thursday. And uh, from there on in every day, particularly the time period from uh, 1.30 to 2 o'clock. That's what they call question period, and that's when the opposition tries to keep the government on the hot seat. So if you're going to look okay. at an interesting time in the House of Assembly, that in particular will be a good time to be watching, because whatever the hot issues are for the day, that's when they'll be heard, and that's when the Premier and his cabinet get their, their feet to the fire, and we try to uh, keep their feet to the fire. So uh, if you're going to tune in, that's the time to do it. Some people don't like it, they don't find it, some people think it's foolishness and whatever, but uh, hopefully we as an opposition will conduct ourselves in a responsible manner and the right questions will get asked. We just hope that they have the right answers to give us. All right, well, thanks so much for dropping by. No problem. Thank you for having me. The staff at the Scotia Bank has begun their fundraising efforts for the Jane Way Children's Hospital. The bank staff has been raising money for the Jane Way Hospital for at least 15 years. They have put together this lovely Easter basket for their annual Easter Basket Jane Way fundraiser. The basket is valued at $80 and tickets cost three for $2 and are available from any bank staff member. The draw date is set for Thursday, April the 8th. The basket includes a large plush bunny an activity kit, stickers, palm pit, lots of Easter eggs, bunny chalk, paddle ball, and fluffy cotton tails or cotton candy, and of course, the basket. The bank staff is involved in about five fundraisers for the Janeway during the year. The ladies told us that they have never sent below $1,000 to the Janeway. For a few years, they sent in approximately $2,000. All branches of Scotiabank take part in the Janeway fundraising. The Burgio branch is the top fundraiser for the past several years. The ladies were also very proud to say that they never ask their customers to buy a ticket and they never take the tickets outside the bank to sell. Anyone who wants a ticket just as to ask one of the staff members. Let's help the bank staff keep up their great fundraising efforts for the Janeway. Buy your ticket today. On Thursday of this week, a crowd gathered near Henry Coley's stage. We went to find out what the attraction was. Here it is. A mallard duck was just sitting around, taking in all the attention he was getting. The crowd was wondering if it was a male or female. It is a male. Only the male sports these beautiful colors. He didn't seem too interested in the fuss he was causing. He ignored the people who were admiring him. He seemed to care less. After a few minutes, he became bored with the old scene and, to, and decided to swim off, looking for more action. Yeah. Hey? 
Stay with us for Off the Rack, the community events, and the BBS Playbill, all after this. They say if you want a wish to come true, never tell anyone. But there is one wish that can make the difference between life and death. And this wish can only come true if you tell someone. Please let your family know you want to be an organ donor. Off the rack. This week as we scanned our tape rack, we came across a tape of storm damage that causes the Irving oil tank to topple over and the Coast Guard Wharf Tower to bend under the pressure of a strong wind. Let's look back to March the 17th, 1991. Good evening. Welcome to the community event segment of tonight's broadcast. I'm Rebecca Young. The winner of the Help Committee TV Bingo was Penny McDonald. Congratulations, Penny. The Burnets will be having the next TV Bingo on Wednesday, March 17th at 7 p.m. One game for $300. Cards are 6 or $5 and are available from any Burnett's member and are in most stores around town. Please support the Burnett's Play TV Bingo, and you could be the next $300 winner. The College of the North Atlantic will be holding an open house at their Bay St. George campus on Thursday, March 18th, from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. at the L.A. Brown Building to showcase its 24 programs. The Burgio Lions Club will be collecting old eyeglasses. If you have eyeglasses that you no longer need, please donate them to the Lions Club. 
You may drop them off with Lion Stan Kasser or Lion Gord Ingram or any member of the Lions Club. The bank staff are selling tickets on an Easter basket filled with Easter goodies. Tickets are three for two dollars and are available from any bank staff member. Draw date is Thursday, April 8th. All proceeds go to the Jane White Children's Hospital. If your group or organization has an upcoming event planned, we will be happy to advertise it for you. Just call the BBS office by Wednesday of each week to have items included in this portion of our broadcast. That concludes the community event segment of tonight's broadcast. See you next week. BBS Playbill. Tune in on Tuesday for a video called The Gill Knit Debate. Try your luck on Wednesday by playing Burnett's TV Bingo. On Thursday, we will have a video entitled Fishing Vessel Stability. Join Pans in the Gang for two stories, a craft, and lots of fun on Saturday morning at 11 a.m. on Pansy's Garden. And I'll be here again next week with This Week in Review. For This Week in Review, I'm Marie Rose. Good night and God bless.